Radio Show with your host, Monty Clark. We stand together and accept that we now live in a world transformed by Fukushima. Monday, Wednesday, and Friday from 8 a.m. to 9 a.m. Pacific Standard Time here on UCY.TV Radio. We relentlessly engage every ear that listens. We expose and confront the complete lack of accountability for the nuclear industry. Consider social engineering programs who view our bodies, minds, and souls as assets on a balance sheet. We discuss vital current issues, interview activists, and engage our audience in an effort to allow all voices to be heard. The Age of Vision Radio Show creates a venue that all will choose. We encourage our listeners to reclaim their power and their courage to take action and save our planet from the ravages of greed and indifference. Our actions matter. Every voice matters. We remind our listeners that happiness is resistance. Love is greater than fear. Good morning, UCY.TV radio listeners. This is Lonnie Clark with the Age of Vision radio show today. Thank you for joining us. Today is, can you believe it, September 7th. I always say that, but I'm just stunned at how fast the world is going by. On the line with us today, it's Wednesday, so we get to do interviews and talk to people who are actually have modified their lives to help make a difference. Uh, I have on the phone with us again Donna Gilmore of San Onofre Safety. Uh, thank you, Donna, for joining us. I really appreciate your help at sananofreesafety.org. Uh, thanks a lot. I'm uh, happy to, to share what I've learned. So. Well, I am grateful that you're out there dedicating your life to this. So, um, well, the last time we were on, we talked about uh, your website, San Onofre Safety, and what a good resource it is, actually, for uh, the rest of the community, the rest of the world who is actually paying attention to this. So let me ask you this. What are some of the things that you've been engaging in the last, I don't know, six to eight weeks? You've been out there charging hard against making an effort to get our, contain our nuclear containers more safe, this, the nuclear waste containers more safe, correct? Uh, yes. Um, one of the things um, I've been working on, I work with people at the nuclear, regular uh, managers at the Nuclear Regulatory Commission and managers and uh, technical staff um, there and at the Department of Energy um, and also at the Nuclear Waste uh, Technical Review Board, which is an oversight board to make sure the DOE is doing what they're supposed to do. Um, and I brought up this issue uh, that n none of them, uh, well, the NRC knew about it, but the Nuclear Waste Technical Review Board didn't seem to know about it, and the DOE, at least at the high management level, didn't seem to know about it. And uh, let me back, let me just explain what the issue is. In Japan, um, at Fukushima, in the rest of Japan, the the canisters that they store their nuclear waste, they call them uh, spent nuclear fuel assemblies. Um, uh, so the, this is the fuel once it um, comes out of the reactor after it's been as it's been burned for energy. Um, it's called spent fuel, even though the the process of nuclear reactors is to take um, uranium that's somewhat reactive and make it super reactive, nuclear, uh, super dangerous, highly reactive with um, radio. It becomes so irradiated that we have to keep it away from humankind basically forever as far as we're concerned. It's a, such a long life and it's a toxic. Anyway, so the industry is trying to find a way to store this waste and they haven't come up with a good solution yet. Um, in Japan, Germany, France, most other parts of the world, um, 
they've come up with a better storage container than what than what we're using in the United States. They use uh, thick casts that are uh, 10 to almost 20 inches thick metal. Uh, they have bolted lids on them. Uh, in, in the U.S., we use thin um, metal, can- st- thin stainless steel canisters. Most of them are only a half inch thick. Now, that's compared to the 10 to yeah. almost 20 inch thick in Europe. Um, and the NRC knows that these, uh, these, the stainless steel can crack, and once a crack starts in stainless steel, it can continue to go, grow through the wall of the container unabated, uninspected. Mm-hmm. And the NRC and the nuclear industry, they have no plan, they have no solution today on how to deal with this problem. So we, we in the, in the United States, uh, we have canisters that cannot be inspected, maintained, repaired, or adequately monitored, and no, 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 no approved, approved plan to deal with if these things start leaking, how to deal with it. And each canister contains about a Chernobyl's worth of radiation, lithium-137. Oh so that's a situation in the United States. Now, I recently learned in, um, from uh, Japan that they, after they had the tsunami and the earthquake, they wanted to open up one of their thick casts to see if anything was going wrong inside. We can't do that because the, the thin U.S. ones are welded shut. So we have no clue what's going on inside. Um, so they opened them up at Fukushima. They learned that the these aluminum metal, uh, these metal uh, baskets that that keep the, the fuel assembly separated from each other because if they crash on each other, you can have a nuclear reaction. It can go critical. Uh, so they determined these were not going to hold up for 60 years. And uh, so they have banned the use of those in Japan. You can no longer use aluminum alloys to, for the metal mm. that, baskets that hold the fuel assembly. Um, and... So how many I do they have? Re- Excuse me, if you don't mind me asking. Do you, how many? How they, many do they uh, have? They don't. In Japan? They don't. Uh, I don't recall the number off the top of my head. They, they had, oh gosh, I think it was ten plus or minus a few at Fukushima. Okay. okay. So you know, well, we have much more. You know, we've got two thousand thin canisters. Oh my gosh. Uh, I think the majority of them have aluminum baskets. They u- they used to use stainless steel baskets. We don't know how those are holding up either. Um, but the aluminum baskets they transfer heat better, so they could they could actually unload load fuel out of the pool faster when they, if they switch to aluminum baskets. So anyway, it was it was a, a cost decision to switch to aluminum Again, baskets. Again, the cost and, decision. Yeah. Yeah. So they all they all are. If you ever want to know why they do something, that's always the answer. So anyway, when I when I learned that Japan was banning aluminum alloy baskets, I reached out to the NRC and asked them, "Well, what's going on in the U.S.? We also have aluminum baskets." And Mark Lombard, the NRC director of Spent Fuel Management, he he manages the group that approves the containers, the aging management plan for storage and transport of all nuclear waste. He said, well, I have to get back to you on that. I haven't, never, I haven't heard back from him at all. I asked an employee at, the, uh, at San Onofre, um, I asked him the same question, and he says, oh, well, uh, the, the NRC is waiting for Arriva to get back to them on that. Now, this is, this is a two-year-old problem. They've known about this for a number of years, Okay. Um, and they're still waiting for Ariva to get back to them on this issue. I mean, what are they going to do? I mean, who is it at Ariva that will get back to them? I mean, is there people? I mean, this is the thing that Dr. John Goffman said. You know, what well, he suggested this. I think it was in Poison Power. He said we need to actually start talking about the names of the decision makers that are making these protest decisions instead of using the company name because they can go around their daily lives without any public acknowledgement that they're harming the planet. Well, I agree with you 100%. I agree with you 100% 
That's why I specifically mentioned Mark Lombard. Mark Lombard is the director of the division. He is aware of all the problems. He tries to hide the facts from all the decision makers. I mean, I, I spoke to former NRC chairman McFarland uh, recently, and she, she came down to make a presentation down here in Southern California. And she was not aware that the, the canisters, these thin canisters were in the U.S., she did not know they couldn't be inspected even on the outside until I told her this. And then when I, and at first she's thinking, you know, that can't be true, right? This is her attitude. And then I explained to her, I said, well, you know, the thick calves, they, they protect from all kinds of radiation so people can get close to them so they can be inspected. And, and, and the thin ones, and as soon as I said the reason that like, you could inspect the thick ones, she said, oh, I see, because they have to stay inside the concrete overpack and they would have no way to do the inspection because they have to stay inside the concrete. So then, then the light bulb went on, and then she got it, okay? Mm. So I'm, I'm, you know, I'm just a citizen in Southern California. Do you think that was genuine? Oh, my God, yes. Oh, definitely genuine. Definitely genuine. And I know it sounds unbelievable, but when mm. I share this, and I, I had the same experience with the Department, Department of Energy. John Kotek reports directly to Secretary Moniz, who's appointed by Obama, and his chief uh, nuclear um, fuel person, nuclear waste person, um, Andy Griffith, I was at a, a private meeting with them, um, both of them, and when I brought up the same issue about not being inspected, they, 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 they didn't believe me. I, well, but, you know, th that can't be true. They're, they were relying on the NRC to do their job. It's the NRC's job to certify containers. And the DOE has a lot of different things to do. If that, if that, we're talking about the highest levels of management. Now, I'm sure there are people at a lower level. Well, I can't even say I'm sure. I'm, I'm, there's likely people at a lower level at the Department of Energy that know the problems with these canisters. But I truly believe that John Kotek and Andy Griffith did not know these canisters couldn't even be inspected on the outside. Um, and Andy kept saying, when I bring it up, he says, well, that can't be true because they have to be. That can't be true because they have to be. And Andy Griffith started out with a, a bit of an attitude. Oh, you know, I'm a nuclear engineer. I was a nuclear, in, in the, I was a nuclear engineer in the Navy. I'm a submarine. You know, like he knew everything. And then I presented him data to back up what I was saying. And then he gave, proceeded to give me his cell number. Um, and his and and, and sch he scheduled. We've had a few meetings now. We've been meeting, and I've been educated him on the facts of the problems with these canisters. And you know, every meeting he comes on, he comes on the meeting. The first thing he says, based on information I gave him from our previous conversation, was, "You're right, Donna. You're right, Donna." You know. So and he's and I I put together comments for the uh, consent based DOE consent based citing meetings they're having where they're talking about trying to find some community to take this waste. Um, and I made comments to that with all the issues I have with their plan. And he's assigned his staff to go through the document and research it. So, you know, I, mm. I'm not too optimistic, you know, what they're going to do with it. But I, I at least have their ear. They at least know the facts. Um, I know what the, the vendors have their line of BS that they give the decision makers, um, and then I and then I usually bust the, you know, their their BS that they're giving them. That's just kind of a thing I've been doing over the last couple of years. Um, but no, I truly believe, um, and I'm not a gullible person. I I, I know some of these people are slick, uh, but I. It, I have I usually have an ability to 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 see through that kind of uh, uh, mm -hmm. stuff. So you know, I mean, I I took a I could get lost taking a shortcut home from a pizza parlor. That's not one of my strengths, but but I I pretty much uh, am good at uh, sizing up uh, people. Uh, work in management for years, and you know, 
any, anyway. But well, any, this is my question. So, this is the thing. Do you think that they're actually surprised or they're just playing coy and pretending they don't know? No, 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 no. Here, here, here's, here's, here's what I've found. I mean, I've been dealing with the decision makers at, at, at Southern California Anderson that runs San Onofre, um, uh, PG&E that runs Diablo Canyon, Humboldt, um, and, you know, other you know, other decision makers at California state government. So I've been dealing at kind of higher levels, mm-hmm. and, and, they, and, and they truly do not know this. Even, even people in the anti-nuclear community, pretty much none of them, None of them that I have met nationally were aware that these canisters cannot be inspected even on the outside, that they, they are subject to cracking, have short-term cracking. Um, wow. It can't be repaired, and that they're only a half-inch thick. They've, the nuclear industry and the NRC have done a good job of hiding the facts from even the anti-nuclear community. Now, do you um, think that I, this has changed the, uh, the, not just the community, but has it changed the culture at the NRC? Like, now that we're, you're putting you, I mean, really, you're like the one-man band here. You're the one leading the charge on this. With your efforts in speaking to them and going to all the meetings, do you think that it's changing the culture a little bit there to where they're beginning to go, hmm, maybe we ought to look at this a little bit differently or ask more questions or... Oh no! The NRC, the change in the culture of 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 who? Well, a the NRC, the anti. Oh no! The NR, the NRC. No, the NRC knows the problem. They are they are the one group that knows the problem. They've they known all along. Pro- they've known all they've along. They've known. Yeah, they've known for for decades. I found documents. Nobody else, I guess, spends their time doing this. I found. Um, in addition to listening into the technical meetings and asking questions of the technical staff at the NRC, I, I go and I, I research. I'm kind of a research and a systems analyst, uh, you know, by my trade. Um, and, and so I, all the information is hidden in plain sight on the NRC wow. website. You just need to wow. know how to search. It's been there for years. So I've had to learn the terminology I- of the nuclear I, industry, but once you know the terms, you can find all kinds of stuff. So, uh, I remember yeah. you said it was Dave, wasn't it Dave Lockbaum from the Union of Concerned Scientists who told you that the thinner canisters, he considers them safer because they can't be dropped? Is that, is that am I correct? Uh, no, it's, uh, well, he, uh, you know, let, let, let's, uh, let, let's, let me, what, can we, let's put, put a pin in this conversation and get back to this. I want to, okay. I started out talking about the problems inside the canister. I just wanted to finish that up okay, so great. I don't forget about it because it's okay. very important. Yeah. So, um, so, so the, so the NRC has, has stalled on getting back to me on this. So I brought it up with the Department of Energy. So they're, they're aware of that problem. Uh, I'm waiting for some kind of paper they're writing. We'll see what what that is. I brought it up with one of the people at the Nuclear Waste Technical Review Board, one of their technical people who's considered a, a top expert in this area. And he um, he did not know. He used to work at the NRC, but they... The NRC and, and you know a lot of the engineers they're they're maybe they're specialists in their little area, okay, so they don't know necessarily a whole lot about other areas of the mm. technical issue, so it's not their area anyway. So anyway, so I brought this up to him. He didn't know about it. He's going to be going to a, a conference in Japan in a couple of weeks, and he said he would. You know, thinks that he'll be able to learn more about it there. Um, so, but the bottom line is, we've got we've got canisters that not only cannot be inspected on the outside and are subject to cracking um, and, and can leak, um, but on the inside, we have this um, uh, unknown problem of what the heck's going on with the baskets, and since they're since they're using aluminum baskets in there, and those are the ones with the problems, 
um, you know, and nobody's dealing with it. So we could have failure with with these uh, baskets holding the fuel inside, and no, nobody's de nobody's dealing with it. We wouldn't um, know and, until when? When would you find out? When the well, you would close? find out after after they've gone critical. After after one of those fuel assemblies crashes into another one inside that container, um, and you know, then it's too late. They've got no plan. They've got no plan in place for that. And they're even a uh, the the one thing you can do if you have a problem canister. Is you're supposed you know you could the, what the MRC approved plan whether it'll work or not I can't say for sure is do you put it back underwater because you know because that protects um, you know keeps the radiation from from getting out you know unless it, unless mm -hmm. that goes critical but that's another subject um, but the MRC is allowing nuclear plants that have shut down that have, the reactors are shut they're they're allowing them to destroy the pools. And the pools are the only way that they have, the only approved way they have to deal with problem canisters or problem fuel. And the NRC is left. And their claim is that nothing can go wrong. And I've read what? the documents. They yeah. said that yes. literally? Oh, yes, yes, yes. And that, in fact, at, at San Onofre, now that the reactors are shut, um, the NRC allow, uh, gave them permission to stop all emergency planning. Oh, because nothing can go wrong. You don't need emergency planning anymore. You don't need radiation monitors anymore. But they, wow. the, the, the Even requirement, yeah. The spent the nuclear fuel fuels off, yeah. on site. Yes. And the NRC yeah. has the unmitigated gall to say nothing could happen. Right. Exactly. Yeah. Wow. What a yeah. lack of... A disregard for human life and all life on our planet. I well, am just the, the people. All right, now when I talk to Mark, I've had a number of conversations with Mark Lombard about all this. I, he actually invited me to speak at their annual nuclear waste conference, and I was the first civilian that been invited, so to speak. And so I went in 2014 and spoke on these issues. But nothing changed. He invited me again the following year, but I'm going, hey, this isn't worth my time and money because, you know, I'm, I'm a volunteer, so I'm all, you know, I'm self-funded. Yeah. Um, yeah. And, you know, it's not worth my time if everything that comes up is just ignored. As long as Mark is in that job and as long as he gets, to, you know, I mean, what, what does Chairman Burns know, and what would Chairman Burns believe, and what would he do? I do not know if Chairman Burns knows that these canisters cannot be inspected. I mean, if the former chairman didn't know, and she claimed to be a nuclear waste wow. expert who was on the Blue Ribbon Commission, Obama's Blue Ribbon Commission for what to do with the nuclear waste, and she's written papers wow. recommending taking the fuel out of the pool, putting it into dry storage, Back in 2003, she was one of the authors of the paper, so she considers herself an expert on nuclear waste, and she truly did not know this, and, and I could tell from her reaction uh, and, and what she said afterward that, that she did not know this. Uh, now, is it going to change her view on things? That, that I, you know, that's a whole other issue. But uh, um, so, so what I see, what I see the commonality with the people um, in the nuclear industry, whether they're employees or managers or regulators, is I see what the New York, I think it was a New York Attorney General called unsubstantiated hope. Mm. And that's a common theme. You know, like Mark Lombard said to me, he said, Donna, you know, you, you worry too much about this. You know, they always figure it out. They always figure out, you the know. Nuclear priesthood, problems. there you go. The nuclear and I mean, and he, you know, and I think he, in his head, he believes it. And and this is they just they're just based on hope that nothing goes wrong. And there's a quote from uh, someone at TEPCO in Japan that said, you know, we were so arrogant that we were so confident nothing could go wrong, and we were wrong. You know, but that there's this level of confidence based on unsubstantiated hope, really, um, and that's the common thread with all of them. And 
for 60 years they've been giving us hope that they'd find a solution of what to do with this waste, and they haven't found one uh, yet. Do you think and they're actually trying? Do you think they're making an effort? Do you think they're really spending money trying to figure it out? Yeah, there's, yes, there, well, this, this is the, uh, gosh, how do I answer this question? Okay, regarding, they are spending money, and, you know, directly or indirectly, it's our money, um, trying to find a way to inspect the outsides of these canisters. Uh, based on what, you know, what I've learned and, and speaking to, uh, you know, corrosion engineers, um, there's no way that the methods that might be available to them are going to be uh, effective enough, even if they can find a way. And then here's the thing. Even if they find a crack in a canister, then what are they going to do about it? I asked Mark Lombard at a meeting. I said, well, let's, let's, let's say you figure out a way to find cracks. And we're talking, you have a combination of uh, where it is on the surface, and we're talking microscopic cracks. And, and I said, okay, and, and then the other part they have to be able to find is how deep the cracks are so they know much, how much time they have before the thing starts leaking. And I said, even if you find a way to do all that, then what? Do you have a, what, how do you have a way to, to repair them? You know, or what are you going to do with it? And the answer I got from Mark Lombard is, well, that's one of the challenges we have here at the NRC. <laughs> and then he starts to laugh. Wow. And what I find <clears throat> when other people learn about this, like I was at a California Coastal Commission meeting trying to stop the Coastal Commission from approving the, these Holtec um, thin canisters. And I managed to get the staff at the Coastal Commission to put in their report to the commissioners the problems with the canisters, because I have the solid evidence to back it up. So I educated them, provided them the evidence. So they put it in their report. They can't even inspect these canisters, et cetera. And one of the commissioners grilled Mark Lombard because he showed up for this meeting in California. So can you inspect these canisters? And he hemmed and he hawed and he tried to give her some bureaucratic BS uh, and she would, she knew better, and she pushed him until he finally admitted, well, it's it's not a now thing, you know. But wow, she did. But she didn't. Uh, we have this on video. I put it on. Uh, it's on the homepage of SanitoFreeSafety.org, right on the homepage. And yeah, but she didn't ask the follow up question. Okay, it's not a now thing. If you figure out how to do it, then what? Then what are you going to do? She she didn't go there, and this is the problem. Is even when I, I get these uh, people in decision making roles to uh, to get that they can't be inspected, um, they never ask the follow up question. I was dealing with an investigative reporter just last week, and uh, and he had met with Edison, and then he met with me, and he says, "Oh well, they're they're working on some inspection technology." And then I said to him, "I go, well, yeah, okay, let's say that they." get some technology, they find a way to work, and they find cracks, then what are they going to do? And he said, oh, I guess I should have asked that. It seems to be, you know, <laughs> the, I, 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 don't, I don't understand this. To me, it's an obvious question, but it doesn't seem to be obvious. To all these other people, so well, I, I think they get paid not to ask questions. I think that's no, their... no, 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 no. I, you know, th this is not. You think they're before, just completely before, that no, dense? Yeah, you know, I, I see this in a, I see this in the and our, and our nuclear community. They just assume everybody's lying or on the take or whatever. It's yeah. not. It's not. It's not the case. It, it's. Uh, I mean, I'm not saying there's not some of that, but. These the decision makers are, are they are they're they're ignorant. This reporter truly did not think to ask that follow up question. I, I have found reporters that I can educate, and then they get they get it. But what's happening with the reporters is a lot of stuff ends up on the you know cutting room floor, so to speak. Mm -hmm. When it gets to the editors, stories get cut. I've, you know, I've, I've heard from, I won't say the name of the reporter, because I called and complained about the story she did, and she said, I didn't want to put my name on that. You know, here's what happened. Edison put pressure, threatened to cut off money, 
blah blah blah. You know, so so wow. the report even if even if I get the reporters educated, it gets stopped at a, at a at a higher level. Now, maybe that's what I need to do is be talking to the editors. I don't know if that is do any good or not, but uh, so there's uh, so that that's kind of the scenario. And. I'm just and sitting then, here sort of dumbfounded thinking about this. Like, it's just admitted coercion or, co I mean, it's it really is coercion. Like, people write a story and then they are forced because uh, of these nuclear, you know, the people with the power, literally, not just electricity, but with power, can, like, subvert a real story. It's just it's 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 fascism to be frank. It's the, the, uh, this is the this is the biggest challenge um, is 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 our our corporate media um, is how do you get the word out? I mean the, the anti nuclear community can talk in their bubble, but how's the general public going to learn about these things if you can't get it in the press? You know where people are going to get their information. So you know you try on social media. The nuclear waste issue is is a much more challenging one to educate people on. Uh, reactors, it's a more simplistic idea. Okay, you know you can have a meltdown; and it'll be a disaster. That's pretty clean cut in terms of understanding the concept. But nuclear waste, it seems to be a, more of a challenging one to. To communicate to people, even in the anti-nuclear community, it takes a while. It usually takes a few go rounds, you know, but, uh, before before it really uh, sinks in. Yeah, this is, and I agree with you completely because most people can understand that the power plant emits stuff, but to think about the waste just sitting there, and in fact, that's part of Japan's ongoing growing problem is the the waste is the big, 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 I mean, that's the big issue around every single nuclear power plant, isn't it, Donna, is the waste. We really have no Well, you know, you know, you know, it's a, it's, they shouldn't even call it a nuclear power plant. They should, they should call it a nuclear poison plant or something. I mean, because the, the main function of the nuclear plant is to create this highly radioactive, lethal waste that you basically have to be protected from forever. And it makes a whole lot more of that with a longer lifespan than the, than the you know, 30 or so years of energy you get out of it. So they really, their, their main product of a nuclear plant is to produce poison. You know, wow. Um, you know that's really if you think about it. Now these these workers that work at a nuclear plant, they they are they're brainwashed. I uh, I befriended one of the plant workers at San Onofre, and he showed me his his uh, workbook from his. Um, the, um, he had to take an exam to to be an operator at the plant. And he, he brought in his workbook where it was showing how radiation can be good for you. Wow. It's right in the work it's right in the workbook. So they get propagandized. And then I read the MIT curric curriculum. You mean the, they have it online. Mean, the, the people that are working in the nuclear industry are getting fed information that nuclear ways that it's actually good for you? Radiation is good for you? And in this workbook, for operator workbook, yeah. The, Part of their education, yeah, they cited some place in I forget where it was, Taiwan or some. I forget exactly where it it, it was where they said in this building the people live longer or something. Yeah, I mean, it was just crazy. I you know wow. I could never. I tried finding a source for that. You know, so so uh, it's there. You know, you have to be somewhat gullible. You know, to to uh, to believe this stuff because the facts aren't there. And then what I find, um, like this person, this employee I'm talking about, you know, he he's not a, he's not a dishonest person. Um, uh, he's, uh, he's just very gullible, and he will filter out facts to, you know, to, that don't fit what he wants to believe. It, you know, so I just, it's just, it's just how his brain works, and I and I see it over and over. This ability to to rationalize and filter out things that don't fit what they want to believe. I, I correlate it to somebody that maybe 
maybe fallen in love with somebody that's really not good for them, but you can't tell them anything because they just filter out anything that doesn't fit what they want to believe. You know, it's like a bad relationship. Yeah, the more you talk to them, the more they'll defend it, even though they know secretly in their hearts that it's not a good thing. Yeah, it's just, you know, it's an, it's an emotional relationship. And, this, and, and basically, it's an emotional relationship with these people rather than a logical well, I've been I've been yeah. studying narcissism lately and trying to understand that because our it seems to me that our culture is really bombarded with narcissism and it seems to me that the nuclear industry is extremely narcissistic. I mean, very abusive, very much. They buy their own story. They batter anybody who challenges them. It's just incomprehensible that we that this m- massive, massive destructive form of energy is just being accepted i mean the there's even actually i mean just this week pilgrim was closed down there's no major news going on about the danger warning people that there might be danger or harm it's just it's as if there is no harm from nuclear whatsoever and then when people get cancer or get diabetes or get all the multitude of problems that comes with it, there's never any acquiescence that it might be brought on by exposure to nuclear waste. It's it's an incomprehensible fact to me, Donna. Well, you know, I mean, you've got, but at the, at the higher levels, you've got, you know, sociopaths, um, you know, running this. They don't care about anything but themselves and... Um, you know, so that uh, that's another level that you're dealing with, and now, do you, and do you, I've, I've 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 worked for so, uh, people that have sociopathic tendencies, and 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 the the way you the way you um, succeed with sociopaths is you get the facts because they lie. They they only get by by lying. Okay, that's and so if you can catch them at their lies, get it in writing solid proof and give that information to somebody who has authority and power over them that's 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 how you you, you beat them at that game you know mm. that's how that's and they they don't ever they don't want to put things in in writing they you know they don't want to get caught right. so hey so what do we do we buy corporate media so now we can hide there because we'll make sure they don't print stories and um, you know, so the, and, and and MIT, the MIT curriculum. Oh, nuclear waste is safely stored. That's right in the NRT curriculum. Wow. Now the in the in um, the, in the Navy, um, who is is heavy into nuclear uh, technology. Um, I spoke with somebody who graduated from the Naval Academy, and I asked him. I said, "Well, what do they tell you about nuclear waste?" Well. They don't really talk about that. They just want us to come up with new things we can do with nuclear. Wow. So there's no conversation about the waste at all. Do you think no. it would benefit? Do you think it would benefit? Like it might be a benefit, as you said earlier, that you don't believe that these people that are running the NRC are aware of the dangers. Do you think it would be beneficial? Oh, no, no. I, okay. Go ahead. I'm sorry. Go ahead. So certain people at the higher level. Yeah, yeah at the that's what level. I mean. But, I mean, these conversations are becoming more and more public, but do you think it would benefit if we had, like, listeners from our radio show to write to these people, like to Mr. Burns directly and ask them specific questions, like, what are you going to do about the fact that our waste is contained in half-inch thick containers and we can't inspect them? Well, you know, I had written I had written to Chairman McFarlane um, when she was in office and talked to one of the people that worked directly for her, and and then I met with uh, Commissioner uh, Barron, who is a, a current commissioner on the NRC. Um, this was before they had named the new chairman. I educated him about the issues. He was not aware of the issues. His chief technical person uh, was in the room with me when I met with him, and <clears throat> And I had, a, like, a follow-up conversation with her, and then now she doesn't respond to them, don't respond to my emails. It's like the communication shut down. Mm. So since the, since the new chairman has gotten in there, it's, it's not, you know, it's 
just like a waste of time to, to deal with them on this. It's, they're just so... And then the other thing I learned is uh, and when McFarlane was coming down, when I learned she was coming down here for a presentation, I sent her an email with some of the facts I'm going over. And I'd also sent an email with, with facts and references uh, to the DOE, that, you know, to John Kotek, who's running those meetings. He's that high level at the DOE. And what it is is they don't believe the information. They think they already know the answer, so they just don't believe or look at it or whatever. So I don't know if writing is going to... Uh, I think it's outdated information. Is that really the issue? They think it's no. Outdated? I think they just assume. I think they just assume it's wrong. And then, and then, in my dealings with um, with Andy Griffith, uh, you know, now he understands they can not inspect. And then, and and he, oh well, they're working on that. And then I provided him information to show where that's not going to matter. Um, and then he says, oh well, you know, if they have a leak. Uh, they'll just put it inside another container, okay? And I said, well, you know, there are no containers approved for that purpose. Um, and and the, the very first, the very first nuclear plant that that was decommissioned, and they wanted to destroy their pool. Just, they asked the NRC for permission to destroy their pool, and the NRC did a, a thermal analysis, heat analysis to determine if they could, if they did have a canister that leaked, if they could put it in another container. I think at that point they were talking about a transfer cap, just big metal cap. Um, and they did some calculations and determined it could stay in there for, I forget what it was, about 18 months or something before it would start overheating. Um, and so they said, well, we'll allow you to destroy the pool um, and you can keep the the, the the leaking canister inside uh, of this thick cask for 18 months, and, but then you have to do something else with it. And that something else was not specified. And, but that but that was the actual, you know, what authorization they gave them to destroy the pool. Well, what did they do after 18 months? Well, this this was a hypothetical. This was okay. If you have, if oh, wow. one of these canisters happens to leak, this is this is the procedure that you have to follow. It, fortunately, it never happened or hasn't happened so far. Uh, but that's wow. that's the, that's this Alice in Wonderland nuclear world we're in. So, uh, it, Donna, yeah. in all so, of your, so I told I told you know I told Andy Griff. I said I said Andy. You know there needs to be a thermal analysis. He's a, he's a nuclear engineer. He understands that. And he goes, and he says, well, yeah, uh, yeah. I mean, and he kind of, uh, he, and then I said, this is like a Russian doll. Okay, you're going to put one inside another. Let's assume that it's cool enough that you don't have to worry about it overheating with no ventilation. Um, then what are you going to do with it? You know, you you can't transfer leaking canisters. You, you you can't even transfer canisters with partial cracks in them, at least according to the NRC safety regulations. So then, what are you going to do with this Russian doll? You're going to you know you're going to keep you have to keep it on site. You can't get it out. You know, and he doesn't he doesn't have any answers when I bring up these legitimate questions. You know, mm. um, and but I think he wants to. I shouldn't speculate on that, but I mean, he seemed to initially be buying. The vendor BS. Oh, we'll just put it in another container. In other, they call it a holder pack. You know, they seem to be buying that line because that's the latest line they're giving. Now they used to. When I first got involved in the nuclear waste, and Edison had public meetings, and we asked them, "What are you going to do if one of these canisters leaks?" Oh, we're going to have a transportable hot cell. It's a a, a building. Or they can put it in this building and move the fuel from one container to another. And I didn't know what a heck a hot cell was, so I came home and did my research and found out there is no such portable hot cell that they could build to do this. And I have found, you know, hard evidence to prove it. So I came back to the next meeting, provided my evidence. Now they don't say that anymore. Now they quit saying that. Now they're on to this new BS 
Oh, and then, you know, the other one is, oh, well, it's not going to happen. Okay, I killed that BS with facts. So now they don't say that anymore, at least not here in Southern California. And then now they're starting on these things with, oh, well, we'll just put it in an overpack. And I called the, I contacted the NRC, Mark Lombard. I said, uh, this is what Edison is saying. They want to take a weakened canister and put it in, in, you know, another container. And is there, can you give me the information about what canisters or cast has been approved for that purpose? And he said, none. Wow. There aren't any. Nobody, and nobody's even talked to him about putting in an application for that, such a thing. Is there absolutely the no regard? Go Donna, ahead. I'm just dumbfounded. All these conversations, all these circles that people, they're all like holding hands and going around in a circle, plugging their ears, going la, 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 we don't want to hear it, but we're the overlords. There's no regard for the loss of human life, no regard to the environment that they're leaking into. It's obvious. Look at what's going on in Diablo Canyon near San Onofre. The animal, the environment has really suffered catastrophic losses there. People are sick. Is there no regard for human life or anything related to like making life better? Well, if, okay, here's what happened. If you become a whistleblower, like this, uh, this engineer Oscar Sharani, he was, um, uh, he was, he was a quality inspector over Holt, he didn't work for Holtec, but he was a quality inspector for for Holtec that makes these thin canisters, one of the main manufacturers. And he produced a report saying, you know, these are no better than trash cans. Quality control is so bad. So they have been built. These are no better than trash cans. And and he got support from an NRC senior inspector that agreed with him. Hey, he ended up losing his job, getting blackballed unable to find a job in his career field. This is this is what happens to these people. He ended up dying from brain cancer years later. But he, he was I don't have first hand knowledge of this, but um, but I was told that Voltec uh, um, tried to bribe him but he wouldn't yeah, you know, well, you know, offer him a job, let's say. And he he, he wouldn't uh, you know, he wouldn't do that. He had some so they find people they find people uh, that they can manipulate or that are willing to go along with this um, or be gullible, you know, whatever. And, and, uh, and, you know, so if you want to it survive... It sounds like the mafia, man. It sounds just like the mafia. If you say anything, your life is threatened, your livelihood is threatened. If you're, you know what I mean, not that they kill you, but you essentially are ridiculed and humiliated. I mean... The have you gotten a handle on where that cultural attitude begins? Like why? I mean, I listened to Moniz, uh, Secretary Moniz, talk about nuclear. He says he's not a big fan of nuclear. He's not a big proponent of nuclear. The there in this since Fukushima, there has been no cultural change towards their attitude towards any of it. They've only dug in their heels and decided they're going to lie bigger. Well, well what, what do you mean? What do you mean? Uh, he's not a big fan of nuclear. He's running the Department of Energy, Energy, whose job is to promote nuclear, and their actions are showing that that's what they're doing. So. What what does that mean? Well, that, 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 well, this is what I've heard him say this many times, that he is not a fan of nuclear, that he wants us to move away from nuclear. I've heard him say that on several occasions. Oh, that's interesting. So then why isn't he? Yeah, that's the, this is my point. It's almost like they just dug in their heels and decided they're just going to... Well, here, well, well here's, like, the, here's the other, here's the other dynamic, uh... All right, you have the you have five NRC commissioners that are appointed by the president but have to be confirmed by the Senate. So, you, you know, even if Obama wanted to appoint five safety conscious commissioners, he couldn't he couldn't get them confirmed. All right, I mean it's not possible. So, as long as we have a Senate that is pro nuclear. Uh, you know, we're screwed, all right, basically. 
so because they're going to confirm people that are looking out for the nuclear industry. And, you know, and it's majority vote. Five commissioners. You could have the chairman be the safety conscious person. I mean, McFarland was m much more safety conscious than the rest. Uh, yeah, Chairman Yasko. Um, I mean, both of them ended up resigning. All right. So you had somebody that was safety conscious somewhat anyway. And what happened to those two chairmen that Obama appointed? They ended up resigning early because of all the, the heat they took for making safety conscious decisions. Who is driving the lack of safety conscious decisions? Where do you think that's being driven? I mean, is it a cultural phenomenon where they just say, hey, we're going to ignore the risk and we know that the nuclear industry is going to come up with the solution, so let's don't talk about it? Well, the the level the level of ignorance about nuclear power and nuclear waste, which what you have is you have the nuclear industry has the ear of our elected officials. They have their ear. They tell them that we have to have nuclear. That we need it for security reasons or right. you know for energy source, for this new BS about we need it, you know, they're calling it clean energy, which I can't believe the reframing of that has succeeded with them. We need to, you know, which is ridiculous. So, I mean, you know, they're trying to redefine the Webster Dictionary definition of the word clean. And these, I mean, and I got some uh, information from Hillary Clinton in the mail wanting money, and in there she talks about... Um, you know, energy does not mention the word nuclear anywhere in there. But if you go to her website, which apparently most people don't, her campaign website, uh, you will see that she supports new nuclear power plants. Yes, she And does. she also supports keeping Indian Point open, even though half the bolts are falling out and it's leaking radioactive, you know, tritium in the ground from the pool. I mean, knowing this, you still supporting keeping Indian Point open. I mean, that could take out, you know, you'd have to permanently evacuate Manhattan if that thing melts down. And the reason in the, the reason in the newspaper article was, you know, we don't want people's rates going up. So they've got this myth that people's rates are going to go up, that we need it, it's critical. It's, it's just total BS. They tried that at San Onofre. And I managed to get my hands on public utility company documents that showed we didn't need San Onofre. We don't need Diablo Canyon for power. We don't need it. Um, and so we had evidence because they had people scared. I was naive at, at one time about this, and I thought, well, yeah, nuclear is really dangerous, but I guess we don't have a choice. I was buying that propaganda um, years ago. Um, and and most people do if if you get you know depending on where you get your news yeah. you know thank yeah. goodness for the for the internet we can get better information now but who's going looking for it you know people have busy lives well, precisely this is the thing like I I think I told you I always thought. San Onofre was an observatory, right? Most people don't even think about nuclear, and when they hear about it being clean and green and safe, they have no reason to question it. And especially in this climate where we, every media outlet, every elected official, anybody in public life, anybody who's on a camera acts as if Fukushima has ended. As if it's over, as if they're just dealing with the decommissioning, there's quote decommissioning, or they're dealing with the aftermath of a nuclear meltdown. People are dumbfounded when you tell them that it's still ongoing, that it's exponentially worse than it was six years ago. I mean, well, I, I, I canceled my subscription to the LA. I did after Fukushima. I I did a, I did a, I was looking for stories in the you know in the in the corporate media about it. I wasn't hearing anything so I went I subscribed to L A Times um, and so I went online and I did a search for Fukushima I only found a hit on the week that it that it that it exploded that's right uh, and that's it they did no other story so I canceled my subscription I mean that's how they do their reporting I'm not you know, so but yeah. that's that's what I see. But it's it, you know it's, they bought our media, so 
so the only thing we have is we still have social media, so we have to make the best of that. We, we could really use somebody that the media does follow, whether it's a movie star, a musician, or somebody that's not afraid to that's speak right. up and take this on. Like, you, you know, like, you know, Elizabeth Taylor took on the AIDS issue. Right. A famous, uh, we need you know. a famous person to say, hey, we're going to stand up for this and make this an issue. That's actually true yeah. because unless we have a major celebrity stepping out of line, but then again, there you go again with the coercion. If they step out of line, they know their music career, their Hollywood career is going to be effectively over. Well, that's I mean, why they have to be. That's why they have to be a big enough star where they don't have to worry about that. You know, Elizabeth, Elizabeth Taylor didn't have to worry about that. She wasn't dependent on corporate money for anything at that point. You know, and and it wasn't. You know, and taking on the nuclear industry is a whole different thing than than AIDS. That's for sure. So I spoke to somebody in in Hollywood. They were a uh, that. Uh, that told me, well, you know, a lot of these uh, movie stars, musicians, they're dependent on corporate money that funds their movies or their events. So, you know, it could, it could be a career killer for them. Yeah, it so, definitely is. But this is the thing. It's yeah. a it's a planet killer if we don't stop it. I was looking at a a little map that showed all the nuclear power plants in Europe. And I, you know, cuz I've been I, I mean, I, I'm just nonplussed considering the fact that we have no answer for the waste. How many of these nuclear power plants are around the planet and the fact that they plan on putting more up with complete disregard to what they're doing with the waste, it's to me, Donna. They're, yeah, they're they're buying the hope that they'll have a solution for the waste, you know, or buying the BS that they're going to have reactors that well, I had. Well, when I was talking to substantiated hope, like you said earlier, well, the yeah. Un- well, I was talking. Now, here's here's what the okay. Here's the way to deal with. The, the waste issue because w- the propaganda what's good about talking to the um, employees or those that are have bought the Kool-Aid you know the nuclear Kool-Aid is you find out what the propaganda is so I would bring up the nuclear waste issues to this uh, San Onofre employee and he said oh well you know we're going to reprocess that waste and be able to use it again okay reprocessing and rather than going into all the problems with reprocessing and how it creates more problems and it's hard, even harder, without going into all the, the reasons that we don't even have reprocessing in this country anymore, um, I just said, okay, well, at the end of reprocessing, you still have nuclear waste left. Then what do you do with that? He didn't have an answer. So the pro- reprocessing uh, propaganda is is... That's what, when somebody brings up reprocessing, rather than going into arguing about the benefits and disadvantages of reprocessing, say, okay, well, you still have waste at the end of that, so how are you going to store that? That That's where you stump up. This reprocessing is used as a, as a distraction. As trying well, to Donna, uh, <clears throat> I, I don't mean to cut you off, but guess what? I just realized we have 20 seconds left. Thank you, Donna oh. Gilmore, for joining <laughs> us Uh Go to Donna's website, org. This is Lonnie Clark with The Age of Fission. Thank you for joining us. Put your courage feet on. Take some action. Do some digging. Do your own research. We can change this culture. Thank you for listening. We'll talk with you again. Yeah.